in the summer of 2021. We had the worst air quality of any urban area in the world. Winds kicked up and drove a lot of dust across the I-15 interstate. There was a big pileup and eight people died. Climate change, population growth, water diversions, all those are acting together to cause a big decline in the level of the Salt Lake, and that's leading to big air quality problems here. Climate change, it's not like some distant thing that you can't see or experience. It's pretty obvious that it's happening. There are about over 2 million people that live here. I think a lot of folks don't realize the lake. It's important to our whole ecosystem and our, our economy and our livelihood. We're six feet below okay. you know, what would be the, the minimum uh, you know, sustainable good range for the lake. Okay. So the eastern half of the lake is basically gone. We have a meteorological tower to measure the winds out on the lake bed to find out how strong they are. I'm trying to understand how the dust gets lofted off of the surface and Carrie's trying to track it and figure out where it's going and how it's going to be impacting people. When I first moved here to Salt Lake in 2000, the uh, mud flats or sand flats were not visible. discovered that wood burning was a significantly larger contributor to poor air quality than was originally thought. The good thing is, it's something you could do something about. If you could get people to not burn wood during poor air quality periods, then that could actually move the needle a little bit. Air Quality Board had seven hearings that were packed with something between 200 to 500 people, standing room only. People were furious. I did chair, I think, two of the meetings with the angry crowds, and the members of the Air Quality Board were getting thousands of messages and phone calls. You know, when I got the phone call from the person who said, I'm watching you, I got my eye on you, it was a little bit like, you know, you start to get like the, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck. It was pretty intimidating. Fast forward five years later, we went back and looked at the filters again and saw what had happened over time. And the contributions from wood burning have, have declined dramatically. So from something like 10% down to like two or 3%. So we've made great strides. In 2018, I became interested in low cost air quality sensors so the sensors we were using, and in fact, the sensors that almost everyone is using to look at particle pollution, do a really crappy job at dust. I know how to acquire data. I know how to store data. I know how to clean data. I don't know if that data makes sense. That's where Kerry comes in. This sensor is a little bit larger, it's more powerful, and it is set up in a way that'll allow you to measure dust in the Great Salt Lake. It will um, transmit the readings to a, uh, an offline database in the cloud. Okay, it does that every two minutes. It also has a GPS so that you know where the sensor is. Also gives us time, so time, a timestamp is really important for all the measurements. So could you refresh my memory? 
a colleague approached us who was in pediatrics and he said, oh, I've got some funds. We would love to put your sensors in the homes of 200 asthmatics. And could you make me them? And I was like, yeah, let's figure out how to do this. Pierre and I were like on Saturday afternoon assembling sensors and packaging them and sending them out. And that was clearly not scalable. Now that the cost and the quality of air quality sensing have come down to sort of a reasonable level that it's accessible to the community, um, I think there are a lot, a lot of great opportunities to take better control of your health. For example, if you've got a football team and if you live in Nephi, Utah, and you're coming up to Salt Lake to play a game, should you move the game to Nephi because of the air quality? When I think a day like today, it's stunning, it's green. It's just a magical place to be. And the thought that this oasis in the desert is about to be lost forever is just something that really pains me on a personal level. There is enough conservation that could be done that could, could fix this, could bring this back to a healthy level. We can alter how we use water and we can recover, but it's not gonna happen in a year or two or even a decade. Uh, it's gonna take you know uh, several decades in order to fully recover the lake. We all need to do something. Individuals need to do things, but we need Im important actors, whoever they are, you know, corporations, religious organizations, whoever, to make big, bold steps that are gonna help us get at this problem. We do need big, bold steps.